semester, we're pleased to host one of our own, Professor John Sullins, who's a member of the philosophy department. And, uh, yeah, go philosophy department. And, uh, <laughs> he's also an advisor for the Center for Ethics, Law, and Society. And Professor Sullins uh, teaches a bunch of classes, including philosophy and robotic, robotics, cyber ethics, philosophy of science and technology, and ethics. And let me say that if you're interested in the kinds of things he's talking about today, uh, he'll be teaching the very cool sounding robo philosophy uh, mm -hmm. next semester. So look for that. Solon's robo philosophy next semester scheduled class. Uh, he works on a bunch of ethical issues surrounding emerging technologies, including uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, artificial life. And his publications, which have appeared in numerous recent venues, include um, the impact on society of these emerging technologies, including the use of personal robots, autonomous vehicles, and if you uh, corner him, you can get him going on all the robot cars that will be moving us around in the next few years, um, and robotic weapons. So there's a lot of really thorny ethical issues here. And today, Professor Solons will be uh, delivering a lecture entitled, Finding a Path to Beneficial AI. So please join me in welcoming John Solis. All right, thanks for the, that kind introduction. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, where artificial intelligence is and some of the uh, societal issues that um, it, it's bringing about. So let's dive into it. So um, the, the title refers to um, work that's being done in the um, AI community right now, which um, uh, there are there are at least two different ways that AI could go. One could be a beneficial way and um, a way in which um, we and it work together in a uh, better world. Um, could also go in a different way and go in a dystopian direction and sort of be the Terminator. Um, and nobody really wants to see that. But um, but there's a lot of fear that that maybe the Terminator version of the future is um, is inevitable. Um, so we got to we have to look into that. And let's let's see what what we can find here. So um, we're currently in the world of of new AI, and um, in the world of new AI, um, this guy here is uh, this is a a very recent article just came out um, last week. And this is Eric Schmidt, and he is the uh, executive chairman of Alphabet. I'm still having a hard time getting used to that. We, we used to call him the CEO of Google, but everything's changed at Google. And um, Google is now going back to its roots as a, a search engine, and Alphabet is going to take on all the stuff that maybe you've noticed in the last few years. Google's been buying every robotics company they get their hands on, every AI company they get their hands on. They're building cars. They're building airships. They're, they're building everything. Um, so Alphabet is now going to do all that. So Alphabet's the new gigantic corporation that, um, that Google used to be. And Google will be a subsidiary of Alphabet. Um, and this guy, Eric Schmidt, is, um, is uh, one of the big leaders in that. So I, I thought we'd pull a couple of his quotes to think about and guide our, our discussion today. And um, uh, Schmidt reminds us that when we're talking about technologies like AI, um, there's actually been this steady evolution. And so what the, the AI that you see today is really something that evolved over the last uh, 50 years. And in fact, the technologies that are working so well today really were, uh, came um, into, into uh, interest in the late 70s, early 80s. We just didn't have the computing power to make any of these ideas work. So we've had these ideas for quite some time. Um, but Schmidt argues that now a big company like Google that has access to tremendous amounts of computing power, more computing power than anybody's ever had on the face of the planet, um, we can actually use some of these older ideas in um, new ways and um, have them actually work. So um, things like uh, deep learning and um, and working with uh, massive sets of data. Um, so he also tells us that it's been um, accelerated, right, by tackling real world problems. So in the past, uh, 50 years ago, AI researchers probably spent a lot of time thinking about how to best play a game of chess or um, how, how, to, um, um, how to 
pull apart sentences and reconstruct them using uh, logic um, so that you could, um, you could get a system to talk to you. All that stuff never really seemed to work too well, but it was computationally cheap and we had very slow computers back then, so that was the kind of research that we did at that time. Um, now, computation is less expensive, so we can use more computationally expensive um, uh, methods, such as neural networks and um, deep learning. Um, so, just think of this, right? How uh, This turns out to be a hard problem for a computer. So let's say you've loaded all your, com uh, your pictures up to um, your machine, and you want to find a picture of your very first dog, because you know you have one in there, but you have thousands and thousands of pictures, and you don't know where it is, um, you should be able to search Google and find that answer. It turns out, though, that it's hard for a computer to know what a dog is and which one was yours and, um, and all these little things that you find so trivial, it finds very difficult. Um, but Schmidt and his crew are very excited because they think they're going to be able to solve that problem very, very soon, and you will be able to do just that with your, with your uh, computers in the very near future. So I like this quote. He says, it's not until the theoretical bumps up against the practical that you get real progress, and that has happened recently. Right? We have this revolution in these machines that were just sort of dreamlike um, just a few decades ago are, um, are in existence today. So um, here's one of the robots that um, Google's bought, this big dog robot, which is a pretty amazing thing. Runs a, um, a, a neural network that allows it to, I don't know if you've seen the videos, I was gonna show it, but we don't have that much time, of the, the researcher kicking the, the big dog robot, right? They, they just walk up to it and they kick it, bang! And then it, it almost falls and then it writes itself and um, people have been really worried about that because they feel like it's abuse, like robot abuse. Um, <laughs> and that's an interesting thing, right? Because these things, using these neural networks and, um, and deep learning systems, have the look and feel of, of an organic um, creature. And, um, and so they start, to, they start to pull upon our um, ethical inclinations towards, towards creatures like that. So let's see, let's get out of this and move into this. So um, there is a group of people, um, most, most notably, it, it's really headed by this guy. This is, he's a uh, philosopher, Nick Bostrom, and he's at um, um, Oxford. And um, if you want to study there, I can write you a letter and get you in there. Um, it's a pretty cool place. Uh, but they're also really weird people. So um, uh, they spend their time thinking about it's the Institute for the Future of Humanity at Oxford. And, they, start, and they, they spend their time thinking about really far future events, right? Things that, that can happen. And, and Nick Bostrom has listed out a dozen or so of these extinction events that he thinks are, are likely for humans. And we'll talk about this if you take my class next semester. Um, we talk about Bostrom and, and his, um, his prognostications. Um, he's a very, very intelligent guy. And he's, um, he's gotten th this particular book is his argument that um, superintelligence is, um, is uh, very, very likely, uh, almost inevitable. So this is the fact that we just noticed that computing power is doubling you know, every few months, um, every you know, almost a year, right? It takes almost a year, doubles, shrinks half in cost. So you get more power, half the price every year. So um, with that, you can just kind of uh, make a rough estimate. You, know, you can figure out how many neurons are in my head, how many calculations do they do roughly a second. You can get a number, right? And that number, then you can track on a chart. And you can just say, when will the computers have the power to hit that number, right? <laughs> so you can chart this. And since this, uh, this trend has been the same for the last 50 years, doesn't seem like it's going to change, you can chart that. And it comes out to about, with, by their calculations, somewhere around 2025. <coughs> so in 2025, computers, like this thing that's sitting on the desk right here, would have the same kind of brain power as you do sitting in your chair, right? And, um, and then it doesn't stay there, right? This, this is the important thing. It just keeps rocketing past. So whereas we have not really evolved more brain power in the past 200,000 years, right, this thing will double the year after it reaches our brain power, right? It'll be twice as smart as you are, right? Then four times, then eight, and it just keeps going, right? 
this keeps going. And they, and they don't sit in isolation, right? They all work together, and they work together much better than we do, right? You guys um, have a hard time networking your brain to each other, but computers have no problem networking their brains to each other. So this thing could grow to be outrageously intelligent, right? And this is Bostrom's claim, and, and he says, you know, that 2025, that's not that far away, right? He, he likens it to being told today that a meteor is about to hit the Earth, right? When we spotted it and it's 25 years away, right? What do we do? Right, you've got 25 years to get ready for the meteor, right? And so he's trying to tell you that you have 25 years to get ready for an alien species, right, landing on um, Earth, um, and it's coming, and it's going to be here 25 years from now. Actually, I've got that wrong. It's not a meteor. It's an alien species, right? He says, Let, what if the aliens beamed in and said, we're coming, we'll be there in 2025, you guys get ready, right? This is um, the same sort of problem, according to Bostrom. So uh, some smart people have, have listened to that and gotten quite excited about it, right? So um, these are not slacks at a, in, in any way, shape, or form, right? So we've got Stephen Hawking there. We've got, um, um, what's his name? The guy who runs Tesla. Um, Elon Musk, right? And uh, Bill Gates there, right? So these guys have gotten together. They've written letters. Um, they've, uh, Elon Musk put his... Uh, money where his mouth is. He set up a big grant um, uh, through the Future of Life Institute, a grant of which I got a little tiny piece of. And, um, and he has a whole bunch of people all around the world right now working on this problem. How do we greet this new vastly intelligent species that's uh, about to um, uh, enter our planet, right? Okay, so... Here it is. This is uh, what I was just talking about, Future Life Institute. Um, so the, their motto is technology has given life opportunity to flourish like never before or to self-destruct, right? We have these two options according to the Future Life Institute. We will either flourish like the left side of the tree, right? Or if we go off on the right, so you notice the right side of the tree is just dead, right? <laughs> So right now, right, you have to make a choice, and that choice will, will determine the entire future of the human race. Um, there has been some criticism of this view. So uh, Andrew Ng is the chief scientist at Baidu. He also um, teaches um, in the Valley, and um, um, he's a very interesting fellow. And um, he says, though, that, that he doesn't buy any of this. He thinks it's a, it's a um, distraction and um, we could be talking about better things, spending money on better things. So let's talk a little bit about um, what, what I think I can add to this is discussion. So if indeed we are looking, I don't, I don't know if superintelligence is on the horizon, but certainly intelligence of a sort is on the horizon. And um, um, I like to call these things AI appliances. So I think they, they spread out, they, they chop up intelligence and, they, and they, they, they help you do things that you couldn't have done otherwise with your natural intelligence. Um, but they're probably not conscious and they probably aren't likely to be conscious um, anytime soon. Um, so how do we do this? How do we, how do we build these sorts of technologies and do a good job on it? That's my, my worry. So. Here's an interesting case study. So this guy, um, Demis, he, um, he's a young guy, a very, very smart young guy, and he came up with a way to, um, his company's called DeepMind, and um, they were just a small, you know, kind of garage company, and they were working on um, game AI, and um, they came up with a way for um, their machine to learn any of the old Atari um, games, right? The, the very first early Atari games. Now, this is the interesting thing. They didn't program a program to beat those games. They programmed a program that could learn those games and then beat those games. And it could play any of them, right? So you could switch it. You switch it from Space Invaders to, um, uh, what's the one where he runs over the pit? 
Pitfall, yes. <laughs> right, so you switch it from Space Invaders to Pitfall, and it, can, it, it, it screws up Pitfall for a couple of seconds, and then it learns Pitfall, right? And then it just aces Pitfall. And then you switch it to another game, and it learns, it fumbles for a few moments, and then it learns and, and aces that game. So this, this uh, system, what was really interesting about it was prior to this, all AI programs had to be coded to beat a particular game, right? They had to be, they had to beat a particular game. If a system was good at chess, it could not play checkers, right? And if it was good at checkers, it could not play chess. DeepMind, however, has built a, a system that you can, that you can task, hopefully his, his hope is that you can task it with any game and it will learn the rules of that game just by playing it and failing until it starts to win and then it um, learns. So um, Demis was really excited about his, his uh, company here, and so was Google. Google bought them for um, a couple billion dollars and um, made Demis super rich right away um, when he was just a kind of a poor college kid. Um, and uh, as a stipulation, this is kind of an interesting move. This hardly ever happens. So, so imagine this. Somebody's throwing billions of dollars your way, and he has the presence of mind to say, oh, that, that billion dollars is nice, but I want to add a stipulation to it. Right? I'm going to add a stipulation. The stipulation is that we have to have an ethics board to, um, because I think this uh, technology that we're developing here has uh, great impacts for humanity. And so we got to do this right. Um, and, and interestingly enough, Google um, acquiesced to that. And they have this kind of uh, uh, background um, ethics board right now, um, which I think I know the people who are on it, but they are sworn to secrecy and can't tell me if they are, which it seems unethical. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's what's going on with DeepMind. Um, so there's also the other end of this story, right? So maybe you, you might have seen the, the DARPA um, trials this summer. And these were embodied robots that had to be, that had to have internal, internal computation that allowed them to um, maneuver the world. What they had to do was, see the thing there, they had to drive they had to get down this little trail here in a cart was the idea. So they had to get in the cart, drive the cart, and then get out of the cart, which turned out to be a real difficult problem. Um, and then they had to open a door. And, and basically, you know, what they seem to have been able to simulate completely is me coming home from the, the bar. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, they've hit that level of, of human intelligence, right? But it's not a very impressive level of human intelligence. So this has been, this is, I know, this is the other end of the story, right? Um, so I don't know, is, is this technology really exciting or is it really too soon? Um, it's, it's hard to say. There's been some fabulous successes and some really startling failures as well. Um, so my, my plan here is to... Um, to try to try to get people like Demis and 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 Elon Musk and and um, Schmidt to buy into this concept, and it's it's been a little hard, but um, but I think I, I, I'm making some headway with some companies. So my idea here is to um, is to not rely on ethics um, uh, boards like Demis's plan, because they're they're just like five guys and they meet irregularly and how do they know what's going on in these uh, in these companies and, they, and when they're going to find out maybe just a few hours before we do and there's really what are they going to do to um, change anything that happens with this technology all they can do is um, is, is shout when when something goes wrong um, so um, so I think ethics boards um, like IRBs um, which are institutional review boards we have one here on on Sonoma State campus. So if we wanted, to, if I wanted to do an experiment, I would have to go in front of an IRB board. Uh, if it was an experiment involving humans, and um, and argue my case, right? And they would either say yes, you can do the experiment, or no, you can't. Um, so things like this, ethics boards, IRBs, uh, they're really great at punishing abusers if they can catch them, if they understand what they're looking at and can catch it. Um, unfortunately, though, it's. Um, uh, the Silicon Valley is really a, a the corporate culture there is all about risk taking, uh, very severely so, and uh, it's all about it's all about charging ahead, um, asking permission later, um, and and just and just um, a disruption right disruption is the key phrase in Silicon Valley, so 
I don't know, they're just going to find ways around ethics boards and IRBs. Um, even if they do succeed, all you really get out of it is this compliance culture, and I think that's one of the things that sort of ruined um, academic research is, you know, in a way, IRBs. Um, they make it so you can't really innovate. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, so what I prefer instead is um, ethics inside the designs. So what, I, what I'm arguing for is that we, we can't let ethics be an afterthought or an addendum right, to what we're trying to do. Um, we actually have to have people trained in ethics as a function of design. So I see it as, a, as another, another constraint that engineers have to, um, have to uh, pay attention to. And, um, and these, kind of, these people that are trained in technology ethics um, should be added as members of the teams or as consultants to the research and design. Um, they, should have, they should play some role in the very early stages of the design because that's where you can actually make changes that will actually have an impact. Later on, the project is ready to be shipped you can't do much to it. All you can do is maybe, is maybe um, uh, carve off um, or, or darken little pieces of the program um, that you might think are dangerous, but you can't really add to what's going on and make it better. So this is a lot of text here. Um, you don't really have to read this. I, I would if we were um, talking you know, in, in another context, but, but this is just kind of my, my uh, five-step plan here on how we mix um, artificial and how, how we in within an artificial or robotics uh, context mix institutional review boards AI um, I mean ethics boards and embedded design so the idea is that you have some people because the, the problem with embedded ethics designers is that they might become kind of insiders to the to the problem um, so you need an you need an, an, uh, a review board that's kind of, that's outsiders you need some people that are insiders, and this I think is going to work better within the um, the corporate context that we find in um, in Silicon Valley. Okay, so here's some some ideas that I have on um, um, once you not only do you have to have ethical people designing AI. <coughs> But now we have this, this new problem, which is a weird one. We've never had this before in human history. We have to make the technology itself ethical, right? The technology itself has to make ethical choices. Um, it has to be an ethical agent. And um, that's, that's really bizarre and new. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about that, where, where it exists. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go from the top of the tree down. So when we talk about super intelligent AI, maybe you know we can grant that it might exist, right? So here's here's an example of one of those graphs that I was telling you about, right? So here we've got um, uh, the accelerating rate of change in um, uh, this. This is a graph I think it was done by Kurzweil. So Kurzweil is the chief scientist at Google. I think he's being moved over to Alphabet. So he's the chief science scientist at Alphabet. So on here we have a graph, and it just lists the com computing power. Um, um, so these are oh, across the bottom here. This is electromechanical systems, right, which go to relay systems for a short period of time in the 40s. We're using that. Switch quickly to vacuum tubes. Switch quickly to transistors. Switch quickly to integrated circuits. Well, I don't know what this is, right? If you know what this is. Tell me, because we'll form a trillion-dollar company, right? Um, but it's the next step after integrated circuits, right? Um, so Kurzweil makes this argument, right? Of course, ev integrated circuits are probably reaching their maximum, right? Pretty close to it, right? This, the, he's a little off on these dates, right? Because we're over here somewhere. But somewhere in here, right? Yeah, um, uh, integrated circuits will reach their theoretical maximum. Um, and we'll have to switch to another uh, technology. So a lot of people say, well, computers won't get as smart as humans because they will, integrated circuits will burn out before they get to the intelligence of humans, right? So therefore, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Kurzweil says, well, look, you could have said that anywhere down here, right? Um, co computers will never get any smarter than this because with electrical mechanical systems reach a, um, a limit, right? But we just surp surpass that with a new technology, surpass that with a new technology, on and on. Why won't we do it again, right? Why won't we have some other new technology that will um, take us beyond the, uh, 
the theoretical limits of integrated circuits. So if you make that assumption along with him, right, then you see this accelerating curve. And here's the actual numbers, right? And you can fit this curve on here. And this curve is accelerating, right, up to 2011 when he had the data, right? It'll still continue. It's still continuing. And what you'll notice is that it's getting, it's getting steeper, right? And so it's going to get so steep that the change will be so rapid. This is what Kurzweil calls the singularity. Uh, at some point, um, it'll just be, you know, your intelligence will be accelerating at the speed of light um, uh, off the planet, right, In, uh, throughout the galaxy. Kind of a weird idea, but that's a, the idea he has. Um, here he has another little cute chart, which, um, which looks at, um, like, the whole history of the planet in kind of a logarithmic chart, right? Logarithmic plot. And, um, and what he's trying to show here is that, is that what we're seeing is just more of the same. Evolution has been doing this uh, for a long time, right? Just from the moment life began through the various um, uh, biological revolutions that happened to the, um, uh, these are still biological. Then we get human, human stuff, spoken language, um, we get um, uh, us, right, our species, art, agriculture, and then this stuff just keeps happening faster and faster and faster, right? Um, whereas this has millions of years in between, these have thousands and these have hundreds, and pretty soon it'll just be decades, right? And then it'll just be years, and then it'll just be months, and then it'll just be weeks, and then it'll just be days between major evolutionary epochal changes, right? Okay, so you combine that, those trends, right, the trends in just increasing computing power with um, changes in software engineering, right, deep learning, evolutionary computation, um, you can start at, you can start to see where somebody like Musk and Hawking and, um, and the others um, start to feel that there's a threat to our existence. Because at, at, at this point, right, see this point right here? See the little human brain, right? So, so we're, we're somewhere right in here, right? Almost to the point where our machines are going to be as smart as a rodent. Rodents are pretty damn smart, right? Um, they're hard to control. Um, just, you know, I don't know if you have them in your house. I, I've had them in my house, and they're really hard to get rid of, right? So pretty soon, your computer is going to get become really hard to get rid of, right? Because every time you try to turn it off, it's going to find a way to turn itself back on, right? Um, and then it's just going to go right up the mammal chain, right? Within, within a few years, right? Within a decade or so, it'll go from being as smart as a rat to being as smart as you, according to this chart, right? So that gets people worried, right? You know, know some things about math. You get, get worried about accelerating curves. Um, so I don't know. So. Um, so here's, here's some counterpoints to this idea. So maybe, uh, so I had one of my, one of my really uh, <coughs> cherished colleagues, good old Carson Reynolds, unfortunately he's dead now. Um, but at a conference he, he asked uh, Kurzweil if Kurzweil had ever heard of a sigmoidal curve. And, um, <laughs> and so that was, that was kind of an interesting thing, right? Because yeah, you could, you, if, we, if we're just looking at this portion of the curve, right, it might rocket up into infinity. Or it might just, you know, plateau at some point. Or it might come crashing back down, right? Um, uh, there's no guarantee that it's always, an, it's always an upward course into the future. Um, here's another possibility. Let's say, let's say Kurzweil's right, and it is a singularity, right? Well, if you have a super intelligent machine that can produce super abundance on the planet, and it really doesn't need anything, and our wants are so insignificant compared to its wants, why wouldn't it just be super nice to us? Right? Because we're not asking for much. It's just like you're super nice to your pet, right? So all your pet wants is a scratch here and there and some kibbles and bits. And that doesn't cost you that much. So you do it, right? You do it. You take care of them. And um, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't a super intelligent machine treat us the same way? I mean, we'd be more complicated pets than a cat is. But pets nonetheless, right?
Um, and other, other issues that I think that we have to pay attention to is um, we have a habit of anthropomorphizing. So, so here's, here's what I'm talking about. We think of super intelligent machine, we think of what would, what would I do if I was suddenly given super intelligence, right? I've got a lot of human weaknesses and foibles and I'm kind of a bastard, really. So if you were to give me super powers, right, I might, I'm, I could probably abuse those, right? It's, it's pretty likely I would, right? Maybe I wouldn't in, initially, but eventually I would, right? Um, uh, Socrates has a great ar argument for this, right, in the, in the Republic. You give people superpowers, they do super evil stuff. Um, so, so that's why we're afraid of superintelligence, because we think, well, if, if, we, if there's this thing that has this, this superpower, it'll just be super evil. Um, but it's, it's likely that when you move to that level, that thing is, if, if, we don't, if we don't program it, like the reason we're such bastards is evolution has programmed us with some really nasty stuff, right, in the background in our personalities, right? And these things help us get through really tough times when, um, when, uh, when the environment's uh, out to get us. Um, then the bastards live, right? And uh, they go on to fund the next generation. And then they start being nice again. Um, so, uh, you know, it's sort of how history works, right? Um, but it, we don't have to necessarily program that into our machines. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just an accident of how life happened on this planet. Um, it's not clear that it has to happen that way every single time. So since we, since, you know, here's the problem, we weren't intelligently designed, but this thing is. Right? This thing is totally intelligently designed. We're making it. We're constructing it from the ground up. It's our baby. So we can make it any way we want. And uh, we can also make it ethical if we'd like to. We don't have to make it unethical. Okay, so let's go to the world we actually inhabit, right? The world we actually inhabit is this world of AI appliances, right? You're so used to it, you don't even know it's there. So you've got, um, You've got them strapped all over your body right now, right? How many people have a smartphone in their pocket? There we go. That's the AI invasion, <laughs> right? That thing, that thing is everywhere around you. How many people have an Apple Watch? Not yet. Hasn't made much market penetration yet, right? It's on its way. How about, um, how many people in here would use, use Siri or Cortana or any of these sort of things every once in a while, right? That's all, that's all AI in action, right? Um, and um, did anybody have this little little smart uh, thermostat in their house? Yeah, I got one too. Right. <laughs> it's really great, All right? So that kind of stuff is is it's 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 not it's not it's not like talking to you like you would think an AI or a robot would, but it's creeping around you, right? And it's doing all this kind of smart stuff. Um, this thing told me that I was supposed to give this talk, you know, uh, 15 minutes before. Actually, it beat you by five minutes, right? <laughs> so it's already smarter than humans, right? <laughs> <laughs> so these things take small tasks that require intelligence, automate them to the point that they are become an aid to our endeavors, and they become pushed so far in the background, right? This is the interesting thing. The first part of this AI revolution is hardly noticeable. So it just happens around you and, um, and you, don't, you don't even really pay attention to the fact that it is happening around you. This stuff's getting smarter and smarter and more and more connected. Your, this thing will, you know, if something's going wrong at your house, it will tell your Apple Watch and your Apple Watch will tell you. And then you can reset your thermostat from your Apple Watch wherever you are on the planet. Okay, so here's, this is a little more complex. I, I don't know if we'll get into this super deeply or not, but, um, but this is my, my uh, crazy plan, so, which I call artificial phrenesis. And, and I might have to change the name of this because only philosophers know what phrenesis means. And this uh, makes engineers uncomfortable. But maybe that's a good thing, actually, because um, they, they like, that's a word I don't know and then, so that way I can pretend to be smarter than them, at least in this instance. Um, but really all it means is, um, is being able to reason through an ethical problem, right? In a, in a human-like way, right? In a way that makes sense. So, um, so 
what I'm trying to get at, let's see, let's go back and um, zoom in on this a little bit. So um, what, I'm, what I'm coming up with this, with this scheme is trying to come up with a way, like I, um, ethics for humans, I think, is different than ethics for machines. So there are a bunch of uh, virtues that it's good for humans to have. And, that, and I think there's a different set of virtues that machines need to have. And that if we dovetail these well, then we will be able to get along. So machines won't be able to replace humans, and humans won't be able to do the things that machines do well. So, for instance, I think these virtues are really important for a machine, um, maybe less important for a human. Um, they should be able to be functionally honest. I don't think a machine can be honest, but can be functionally honest. Um, and it should have some context sensitivity, um, be able to, like, like right now, Siri doesn't ever really understand your context. So, so Siri is not going to, Siri doesn't behave differently if you're in an emergency or if you're just asking it where the nearest ice cream can be found, right? It doesn't really sense that um, context. So um, it would be nice if these machines could start to. How could they? This way. So this is my system sketch. And the thing I love about this, I love box diagrams because um, everything that's philosophically hard and impossible, you can just stuff into the arrows. You don't have to actually <laughs> explain any of it. Just leave that as a problem for somebody else. You know, just like, that's obvious, right? <laughs> just do that. Um, so here's the thing. You start up at the top and you go, you go through this process. And, um, and so what I'm trying to do here is, is create a model where where if you're really good at search, how would you do ethics? So machines are really good at search. Is there a way to um, harness search such that it could become a way of solving ethical problems? So this is just my way of doing it. Um, you'll notice that I've got, I've got human mentors in there. I've got the Fronamons right there. And I've got um, uh, massive databases of ethical case studies that the machine can search through. Um, so humans get involved at this green level. And then the machine does all this other stuff. And this is, this is not uncommon to how just a search engine works. So, um, so it just breaks the problem into this, this little arrow can go on for millions of different um, uh, things. And it just, it just finds little bits. It, it breaks the problem into little bits. And then once it's got, it got answers to each one of the little bits, it tries to reconstruct those into something that's a, a, a sentence or a paragraph that's going to make sense to humans and meet, meet their goals that um, they've already told the machine they were after. And then, um, it'll, and then it'll give you a sense of, um, it, it can spot urgency, it can spot um, whether or not it's very confident in its plan, and then the human agents and users can accept or reject that plan. Okay, now it's just going to See, this thing doesn't realize the context it's in. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, wrapping up here. Um, when it comes to machine ethics, I think it's really important for us to remember that these things aren't out of control. Maybe they might get out of control, but they'll only get out of control if we let them get out of control. If we consciously design them to be out of control. So, right now, we control these things completely, and we should... Um, uh, understand and honor that. Um, we have to embed ethics into the designers and the design itself. It's really important. And if we were to succeed at this, then um, we don't really have to be worried about um, the uh, AI of the future. The AI of the future will become beneficial to us. Um, if we don't, that's another story. That's the dead side of the tree. But let's not go there. Let's go to the living side. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have all kinds of companies developing AI. Uh, you showed a couple of them, mm -hmm. uh, and ethics might not always be agreed upon between them. How do you how do you address the fact that ethics might change from company to company? Uh, the same way that ethics changes from person to person. So um, uh, some people, some people like maybe maybe there's even people in this room that sort of feel really religiously motivated in their ethical systems and and other people might not maybe some people are like um, like uh, um, Peter Singer and just very utilitarian and, and they don't really try to solve problems from a religious ethics kind of way um, I don't think that 
really matters in the end. So, so I think every company, as long as they choose an ethical stance, it can, it can change from company to company. They can have different, um, um, a, a different feel um, to the way that they, that, that they solve these problems. They already have a different feel to the way that they, you know, that when Google, Google now works very differently than Siri, Apple and Google have, have a, a slightly different way of viewing the world, and that's fine. Consumers then have some choice, right? You wouldn't want a monolithic ethics system coming out of Silicon Valley that you were strapped to. You would definitely want, want a choice. Um, so uh, last week when I was at a meeting with um, ethics, ethics and autonomous vehicles, there's a bunch of the companies that are building autonomous vehicles, and they and they they came to this same problem, right? They said, "Well, look, because uh, engineers like want an answer, right?" And and unfortunately, ethics doesn't really have an answer like that. It's um it's not a mathematical uh, uh, phenomenon. So uh, so what what we're just trying to get them to see is that is that is that ethics is a, is more social, and of course, each company is going to make slightly different choices. Um, when they're way off base, then that's where ethics boards and IRB type situations, maybe maybe these things would exist in in engineering um, societies, might might condemn them for the choices that they made, right? Um, but I think there'll be a, a huge difference between the, the kinds of, the, the way that an Apple product um, uh, exists in the world to the way an, an Android product exists in the world. And I'm fine with that, it's, it's okay. So if we have all these different ethical <coughs> agreements upon people, like say with autonomous cars, if all the ethics are different, different within those cars, wouldn't that be just the same as having different people driving them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So where's the, where's the, where's the progress? That, except that they're all, they're, it would be different, extremely skilled people driving all our cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean these things can do, these things can do things that are, that are, that are really phenomenal, you know. They're, 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 their ability to navigate through traffic is way better already than, than most humans can achieve. But, um, but you know, they, they, they fail in, in other instances. They, they have the, that's always the way it is with AI. There's just these really amazing accomplishments that the machine can do, and then it just falters on, on other things. Um, so right now they have a hard time, you know, telling the difference between a, a dog, um, you know, and, um, and, um, and a person, right? It, it's it's it, to to the machine. It's all just shapes in motion, right? And they, they can they can make some guess as to what they are, but they don't really know. It's not like you when you look around the room, you instantly know where the people are, where the chairs are, right? The machine has to do all these really complex comp ca calculations to make that happen. Mm, T, then over here. Um, when I see this, uh, this curve going up here, there seems to be a conflation between the concept of intelligence and the idea of intentionality. Mm -hmm. You can make a machine smarter and smarter and smarter, mm -hmm. but if you don't give it goals and purposes of its own, mm -hmm. I mean, this whole thing about the invading species just doesn't seem to apply. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean you made this distinction, you're talking about appliances and agents. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't one way of dealing with this problem just see, let's build more appliances and fewer agents? You know, we yeah. gotta think mm -hmm. about what the line is between mm -hmm. those two. There's probably, right. but but I just don't see what you necessarily have to assume just because the machines are getting smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're they just like, make us smarter, really, they're, mm -hmm. if they're just appliances. Mm -hmm. We only have to worry if they're starting to make decisions of our own, deciding right. not, you know, how to get there, but where you're gonna go. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, that with, within the history of AI, you can see these, these two opposed engineering tracks. One engineering track um, is the idea that machines will replace humans at every level and, and supersede humans at every level. And then there's the, the other track, which is AI gives us a bunch of tools to make us more uh, capable agents, right? Um, so, that, so this is the difference between artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation, right? The difference between AI and IA. Um, and um, the IA movement, which is really what I come out of, because that was that was sort of what was going on at Xerox Park when I was working there, is um, um, I think superior. But you know, I mean, maybe that's just because that's the tribe I come from. Um, but I but I but I agree with you. Like we don't have to do that the standard AI model. We don't have to we don't have to engineer ourselves into extinction. That's a choice, right? It, we're not we don't have to do that. We can also go this different route where we engineer ourselves into a more capable agents, right? And that would be a way of solving, or at least dealing, solving a lot of the problems that you're raising here. We wouldn't need it mm -hmm. in, inbred 
uh, mm -hmm. inborn ethics in the machines mm -hmm. if the machines didn't have any intelligence. Oh, well, that, that I might disagree with you on um, because um, a, lot of the, a lot of the times, like for instance, your, your autonomous car is going to be making choices far faster than it can ask you for input. So um, it's going to have to make some ethical choices on its own in milliseconds wait, before you even know that there's an ethical problem yourself. But it's not going to tell you whether you should go to work today or not. No, no, that, it can leave that kind of stuff yeah. to you. But it could, but it's going to have to control the emergency situations, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's all about delegating, right? What can the machines do better than us? Let them do it. And what can we do better than machines? Let us do that, right? And try not to cross, pollen, I mean, cross, pollute across these borders too much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you think that this relates to um, like like drones and like warfare? Do you think that it comes kind of into that? Do you think that like, mm -hmm. as people like we are passing like crossing that line into mm -hmm. like okay now we're using these like artificial intelligence to like take lives of other people? Mm -hmm. And do you think that 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 there's mm -hmm. a way to involve ethics in that? Yeah, um, that's a great question, and that that is another large uh, portion of my work. So uh, next month I'll be at a conference in Monterey at the um, Naval Research Place down there and it's a conference uh, you know on on this problem and so it, it's much more it's much more um, uh, dark when we get into the AI weapons because AI weapons really do make this very critical um, ethical decision right who do I kill is are you a terrorist or is that the terrorist right and which one do I kill right and you say that one right but of course you're lying to me so uh, the machine has to like like understand lies and and try to tell truth which one's telling the truth and it'll make a decision right and and somebody's gonna die um, and that's a that's a pretty fraught that's a very fraught and difficult ethical question it's it's hard for human soldiers to solve and they routinely fail at it, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, that that's 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 where I think Elon Musk and all these people are right to be worried because we're pushing that technology very very quickly and um, far faster than we've actually spent time thinking about the ethical implications of it. Um, so, so yeah, there's a few of us around the world um, looking at it. There's also this movement to ban killer robots that's going through the UN right now. Um, which might or might not succeed, in which case we'd have an arms control treaty which would say you can't build these weapons in the first place. Right? That, and that may happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it for time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.